for our next uh, panel uh, as individuals uh, uh, via video conference. Uh, uh, Mr. Paul Howe is a professor and chair with the Department of Political Science in the, uh, with the University of uh, New Brunswick. Uh, welcome, Professor Howe. And uh, Pauline uh, Bench, who is a lecturer with the uh, University of uh, Toronto. Welcome, uh, Ms. Bench. Uh, we appreciate uh, both of you uh, taking time to uh, contribute to the committee's uh, consideration of uh, Bill C-23. I am uh, assuming that you both have opening statements, and Ms. Bench will offer you the first opportunity. Thank Please you. proceed. I am pleased to participate today in your discussion uh, of this uh, proposed bill. My doctoral uh, dissertation completed in 2012 compared the regulation of party finance, the powers of enforcement agencies, the role of the judiciary, and so on in Canada, the U.S., and U.K., which are comparable mature democracies. I focused on the period to since 2000, but conducted a retrospective to back to Confederation, so I am quite familiar with both informal and formal ways to regulate parties. My research demonstrates that it is important to compare Canada only with other mature democracies which have strong networks of institutions guarding democracy. And this finding reinforces that of Michael Boda, who is now the Chief Electoral Officer of Saskatchewan. So by, uh, by a vigorous network of institutions, I mean political parties, citizens, a free press, relative transparency of party finance, parliament itself, social media, and so on, which have all worked together to protect Canadian democracy and earn its global reputation. Two factors differentiate Canadian practice in the administration and enforcement of party finance rules. Only Canada, among these three countries, combines the oversight of elections and the oversight of party finance under one agency. Second, there the party enforcement, party finance enforcement agencies of the US and UK are headed by a group of nominated commissioners who serve limited terms rather than having one appointed head who serves until age 65, as is the case of the chief electoral officer, the only officer of parliament to have that length of tenure. The separation of party finance enforcement from election administration is not a novel idea. It was endorsed by the Barbeau Committee in the 1960s and by the Royal Commission on Party Finance and Electoral Reform in the 1990s. The proposed move, therefore, in my opinion, is the final step to implement the recommendations of those two prestigious bodies. I support this restructuring for several reasons, but will limit my comments to the following. First, while the Commissioner of Canada Elections is technically in charge of party finance administration, he is selected by the Chief Electoral Officer and the Commissioner reports to Parliament through the CEO. This is a muddled reporting scheme. Second, even with the proposed changes, the Chief Electoral Officer will keep his long term of office and he will retain many other powers including the following the power to initiate and advise Parliament on matters of interests, for example, his newly appointed committee to study electoral reform. He will retain the chair of the advisory committee of political parties and the powers thereto, the power to choose future broadcasting administrators, arbitrators, and finally the power to appoint external members of the Audit Committee of Elections Canada. The Office of Chief Electoral Office is, Officer is perhaps the single most influential position in the entire Canadian Civil Service, and pronouncements by him carry enormous weight. Canada has had and continues to have able and de dedicated Chief Electoral Officers, but that does not necessarily mean that they are right all of the time. Federal Court Justice Martineau in a two 2010 hearing, for example, found it necessary to rebuke overreach by the Chief Electoral Officer. He stated that Parliament has expressed no clear intention in the Act to empower the CEOC to play a general regulatory or supervisory role in the creation or enforcement of rules regarding the financing of electoral campaigns or the conduct of participants. And so I would suggest that Bill C-23 may have flaws, but the proposed separation of responsibility 
over party finance regulations from that of elections is a sensible one that focuses the CEO's mandates on strong elections. It, in conclusion, Canadian democracy is protected by a strong network of institutions, not just one office, and will be strengthened, not weakened, by the proposed restructuring. I welcome your comments and questions on other parts of the Act. Thank you, Ms. Bench. Uh, Professor Howe, please proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I had the opportunity to speak last week to the House of Commons Committee examining Bill C-23. I have concerns about a number of provisions in the bill, but the principal issue I raised was the proposal to limit Elections Canada's role in promoting voter turnout, requiring it to provide information to the public only on matters of when, where, and how to vote. I pointed out that the principal reasons why many young people are failing to vote nowadays have little to do with difficulties with the mechanics of voting, and therefore the broader role of Elections Canada in promoting voter participation should be retained. I'd like to elaborate on this point today. One of the background papers on Bill C-23, found at the government's democratic reform website, provides a rationale for limiting Election Canada's role in terms of promoting voter turnout. Under the heading Back to Basics, it notes that a study done for Elections Canada on youth participation in the 2011 general election found that about 25% of youth non-voters indicated that not knowing where, when, or how to vote played a role in their decision not to vote. If we take this result at face value, it would seem to suggest that there are substantial gains in youth voter turnout that could be achieved through concerted efforts to make young people better aware of the mechanics of voting. I've looked closely at this study done for Elections Canada, and in fact Elections Canada has also provided me with the original survey data to examine, something it will often do for interested researchers. I've done a bit of my own analysis to learn more about these young non-voters who said they did not know when, where, or how to vote in the 2011 federal election. For example, the survey asked all respondents if they knew which party had actually won the election. Fewer than half of these young, young non-voters who did not know when, where, or how to vote could correctly identify which party had won the election. Here's another interesting result. Only three out of 10, I repeat, three out of 10 of these young non-voters who did not know when, where, or how to vote could provide the correct name of the premier of their own province. And just over two in 10 managed to answer both of these very basic political knowledge questions correctly, the name of their premier and which party had just won the election. Clearly, these young people who did not know when, where, or how to vote also did not know a lot of other things about the federal election and Canadian politics more generally. There are a few points to draw from this. The first is that many young non-voters are disconnected from politics and current affairs in a quite profound way. Trying to inform them about election procedures is therefore a very challenging task. If a young person does not know which party won an historic federal election that just took place, or does not know the name of their own premier, it is an uphill battle for an elections body to try to educate them about when, where, and how to vote. The fact is that Elections Canada already does a great deal to make people aware of the mechanics of voting, as detailed in its various post-election reports. For anyone who really wants to know when, where, and how to vote, that information is readily available. The second important point we can draw is that even if you could somehow make these young non-voters aware of when, where, and how to vote, in most cases it would make no difference to their voting behavior. The underlying reason that many of these young people are not voting is that they are deeply disconnected from politics, possessing little general knowledge and having minimal political interest. Not knowing anything about voting procedures is a symptom of their disengagement from electoral politics. It is not the reason they do not vote. I'm certainly not suggesting Elections Canada should reduce its efforts to inform the public about voting procedures and to ensure easy access to voting for young people. This is in fact an ongoing priority for the agency. But I am emphasizing that the gains in voter turnout among young Canadians likely to be achieved through this approach are relatively small. The problem of low voter turnout among young Canadians is more fundamental and requires efforts to address underlying educational and motivational dimensions of the issue. Elections Canada has a key role to play in these larger efforts. I would quote from an Elections Canada report after the 2011 election, which discussed this issue of low voter turnout among young Canadians. Quote, the Chief Electoral Officer has called for a concerted effort involving parents, educators, youth, politicians, and the media to give young Canadians the tools they need to play an active role in democratic life. 
This effort includes supporting civics education to increase young people's knowledge about politics and democracy in Canada. The approach outlined in this quotation seems to me exactly right. Elections Canada should not and cannot undertake educational and motivational initiatives alone, but it has a vital role to play in raising awareness of the youth voter turnout issue, as well as encouraging and facilitating wide-ranging initiatives by others. If Bill C-23 passes in its current form, this role will be taken away and there will be no one leading the way in Canada on the issue of youth voter turnout. This would be a tremendous loss and would, I believe, represent an abdication of the government's responsibility to be serious in its efforts to attempt to address the pressing problem of political disengagement among young Canadians. Thank you and I would welcome any questions. Thank you, sir.